here. I want to uh, thank Pastor Joel for the invitation. I'm grateful for all of you who came um, live, and I appreciate everyone who was online and joining us there. Um, let me start by introducing myself. So, Yate, Mark Charles Yenishia, Tsinba Kedene Nishle, Dotoy Huglini Bashas Chin, Tsinba Kedene Dasha Che, Dotoy Chitni Dasha Nella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, with our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Tsinbuke Dene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbuke Dene. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Todachitni. And that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I want to acknowledge today that we are standing on the land of the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miamiya, the Ochete Sakowin, the Menominee, the Ho Chunk, and the Kickapoo. These are the nations that were here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And these are nations that are still here today. These are the indigenous hosts of these lands. I want to thank these nations for their stewardship of this land. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be on these lands today. We have about two hours together. And I'm always excited when I have more time rather than less because I have a ton of information to pass off to you. And over the next two hours, you are going to feel a wide range of emotions. And I want to just help you understand and even prepare you for what's coming in the next two hours. So during the next two hours, it doesn't matter if you're right-leaning or left-leaning. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're white or another race or ethnicity. Um, you're going to be deeply impacted by what I'm saying. There will be a few times during this lecture that you're going to want to stand up and be tempted to throw something at me. There'll be other periods where you'll want to look for a very polite or maybe even not so polite way to walk out. I want to encourage you to stay seated. There will be times where some of you may begin to feel like your individuality justifies you and precludes you from the things I'm talking about. There may be other times where you're going to want to justify yourself and your family and your nation because, well, everybody does this, and so it's not that bad of a thing. I'm going to challenge things you've been taught in Sunday school. I'm going to challenge things you've been taught in school. I'm going to challenge things that both your favorite and your least favorite pre uh, um, politicians have said to you. I'm going to point out that much of what you've been told about our nation's history, as well as our foundations, are just flat out wrong. And at different points, you're going to want to, as I said, either stand up and throw something or walk out. I deeply encourage you to stay seated. We have to get through all of these things because there's a bunch of things as both a nation and as Christians, we have no clue how to talk about. And I want to attempt to engage that conversation today. In fact, the evidence of how hard this conversation is, is visible in how many people are in the room. Some of the hardest events I have are when I go and do an event like this, and it's promoted as this is Mark Charles, and this is what he's going to be talking about. The reason is, is because people will read that little blurb and say, I don't know what the doctrine of discovery is. It sounds kind of threatening. I don't think I'm going to go to that. These are the hardest events to get people into the door. Some of my best events are when I'm on a stage and there's already something going on. It's a conference or someone else is doing something as well. And I've been invited and the people are in the audience and the room is packed and no one has a clue who I am or what I'm going to say. And they don't figure it out until it's too late to leave politely. 
And those are some of my best audiences because they actually never, they, they would never self-select to come and hear what I'm talking about. But once they hear it, they can't help but be impacted by it. And so there's a chance by the end of this day, if you don't walk out and you don't throw something, you will want to run out and find as many of your friends or family members or colleagues or others or in your relational circle who you will say, you have to hear this presentation. You have to listen to this. And that's one of the best, the next best way to get, to get people into the door. But that's really one of the hardest challenges. So today, we are going to have a conversation about the doctrine of discovery. Now, before we can get into what the doctrine of discovery is, we need to get an understanding of how our nation and our church came to this understanding. Just a brief summary. The doctrine of discovery, it's a series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. So the question we want to start with is how did we get to this doctrine of discovery? And especially, how did the church get from the teachings of Jesus, who said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, how did it get from there to a doctrine that literally said you can enslave and kill people who don't look like, sound like, talk like, or act like you? And to understand that, we have to go back into history. Now, one of the other things I'm going to try to convince you of today, because our nation is having a conversation today about white Christian nationalism. And much of the blame for white Christian nationalism is being laid at the feet of white conservative evangelicals. Now, that demographic has done quite a bit to deserve a bulk of that blame. But what I want to demonstrate to you today is that this is actually not that simple of a problem. It's not just a single demographic that struggles with this, and therefore if we could just correct them, we would all be okay. I want to help you understand today how white Christian nationalism is a bipartisan value that was written into the foundations of our country and has created a dysfunctional theological imagination for virtually every US citizen. It impacts everybody. So to understand this, again, we have to go back quite a ways. I want to go back to the notion of a land covenant that the people of Israel had with the God of Abraham. So the God of Abraham made a covenant with Abraham and later with the nation of Israel. The covenant was fairly simple. If you obey me, I will bless you and you will flourish on these lands. And if you disobey me, I will curse you and remove you from these lands. We see this very clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 30, when the people of Israel are about ready to cross over the river Jordan into their promised lands, and God is reiterating the threats and promises of the land covenant. And he says, keep the commandments and the ordinance and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land whether we go to take possession of it. But if our heart shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land whether we cross over this river to possess it. So the land covenant had a barometer. The barometer that the people of Israel had was their prosperity. If they were prosperous, they knew that they were probably doing well in their relationship with God. 
if they were not prosperous, if their borders were porous, if they were not on their promised lands, if their children were hungry, if they were not secure, there was a good chance there was something out of line in their relationship with God. Their prosperity was not their only barometer with their relationship with God, but it was a fairly simple and a fairly prominent barometer that the people of Israel could use to see how they were doing in their relationship with God. Now, when Jesus came into the world, the people of Israel were not prospering, right? They were actually living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. They had not heard from God or his prophet in hundreds of years. And the nation was earnestly looking for God to send his Messiah to come and return them back to the greatness of the kingdom of David and the reign of Solomon. This is what the people are waiting for. And this is why the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and all these sects were rising up and they were trying to think, what can we do to compel God to send his Messiah quicker? They were trying to find a way to get back into God's good graces so the Messiah could come and reestablish the greatness of the kingdom of Israel. Now, Jesus knew that he was coming as the Messiah but he also knew that he had a different role to play than the people expected. And so he began very early to change expectations. Yes, he was the Messiah, but he was born in a barn and raised as a refugee. Yes, he was the Son of God and angels announced his coming, but they sang to a group of shepherds, right? He was trying to change their expectations a little bit. Early in the Gospels, Satan came to Jesus to test him. And he took him to the top of a high place and he showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and said, because he thought the kingdoms were the goal, that if Jesus would bow down and worship him, he would give all of these kingdoms to Jesus. Jesus essentially said that's not the goal. And he walked away from Satan. He was not tempted by that. Later, John the Baptist, who was the one announcing the coming of the Messiah, was the first to point at Jesus and say, this is the Messiah. He was in jail. And he heard stories that Jesus was out raising the children of widows from the dead and healing the servants of centurions. Now, this was not the picture of an imperial messiah that John and most of Israel was hoping for. And John was very perplexed. And so he sent his servants to, he sent his disciples to Jesus. And they asked him, he said, hey, are you the one who's coming? Or should we wait for somebody else? Jesus turned around. He healed more of the sick, cast out demons, gave, sound, gave hearing to more of the deaf and sight to more of the blind, helped more of the poor. And then he turned to John's disciples and said, go back and tell your master what you've seen. And blessed is he who does not stumble on my account. Right? Jesus is rebuking John, basically saying, this is who I am and this is where I'm going. Either get on board or get out of the way. A few passages later, Jesus was out teaching. And there were thousands of people there. And they were in a remote place and the people were hungry. And his disciples said, we should feed these people. You should send them away, and we should let them go get something to eat. And Jesus said, well, what do we have? They went out, right? They found this little kid. They grabbed his lunch, came back, said, we, we have five loaves and a few fish. This isn't even enough for Peter to eat, right? This is nothing. And Jesus took what he had, looked up to heaven and gave thanks, broke it, and fed everybody. And the people were so excited about what Jesus did that they came to make him their king by force. Again, Jesus is like, no, my goal is not an earthly kingdom. And so he walked away. Later, chapter 8 of the book of Mark, Jesus was with his disciples. He had done all these miracles, showed them his authority, showed them who he was, and he said to his disciples, who do the people think I am? And Jesus said, or his disciples said, well, some think you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Others think you're Elijah. Others think you're one of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus said, well, how about you? Who do you think I am? 
Peter, who was the spokesman for the group, stood up and boldly said, you're the Messiah. Now, Jesus didn't get excited and say, ding, 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 you won. Let's now go tell everybody, right? He told the disciples to be quiet. He shushed them and said, don't tell anybody. And then he began to teach them that the Messiah, the Son of Man, must suffer and be persecuted. Now, like you and I, the disciples were not very excited about that idea. And so Peter very boldly said to his teacher a rebuke. And he said, you don't have to die. And Peter, when he saw the disciples listening to our Jesus, when he saw the disciples listening to Peter, turned around and rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. And he went on to teach them that not only would the, would the Messiah be persecuted, but they, as his disciples, would be persecuted. In Luke chapter 21, it says, They will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. You will be betrayed, even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. So Jesus was not painting a very rosy picture for his disciples. He was not getting them excited to follow him. But then he went even further and he began to change their paradigm. And he said, you're actually going to have a new barometer now. Your barometer is no longer going to be your prosperity. Blessed are you, not when you prosper and when your borders are secure and when you're obedient. You are blessed when you're persecuted. You will not know you're doing well in your relationship with me when you are wealthy and secure and safe. You will know you are doing well in your discipleship when people are persecuting you. He is changing their barometer, and the disciples do not like this new barometer. In fact, the entire second half of the Gospel of Mark is about the disciples pushing back against this barometer that Jesus had for them. Now, towards the end of his ministry, Jesus was actually standing before Pilate. He had been arrested, and he was standing before Pilate, and Pilate did not want to kill Jesus, did not want to crucify him. He was actually looking for a way to let him free. And he was asking Jesus some questions. And Jesus was not helping his cause because he wasn't answering Pilate's questions. And finally, in, in exasperation, Pilate said, don't you know I have the authority to free you or to kill you? And Jesus scoffed at him and said, you have no authority over me except what my Father in heaven gave to you. He said, my kingdom is not of this earth. My kingdom is somewhere else. It's my kingdom were here. My servants, the angels, not my friends who I call my disciples, would come and set me free. He was adamant until the very end. He said, my kingdom is from somewhere else. So throughout his entire ministry, Jesus was adamant. The people of Israel wanted Jesus to be this earthly kingdom that they could touch and they could see and they could worship. And Jesus kept saying, no, my kingdom is not here. My kingdom is somewhere else. I am not going to be your earthly king. I am not going to make an earthly kingdom. And it wasn't until Pentecost that the disciples finally got it. Jesus died alone. Nobody believed him. Even in Mark, we're told the women ran away and said nothing because they were afraid. His disciples had all abandoned him. It wasn't until Pentecost when the disciples finally clued in as to what Jesus was saying. And as a result... Most of the disciples went on to die a martyr's death. Killed for their faith. And so the early church, the first century church, right, was known for its persecution. You had this group of people who shared this faith, they were in relationship because of their common teaching and their relationships and their proximity to one, each, one another. And they were this early church. 
And most of the church, very frequently, the church was under persecution. They were being killed and persecuted because of their faith. Now, if you're like me, you've probably blamed the heresy of Christendom, Christian empire, on Constantine, right? He's the emperor of Rome who converted to Christianity, and he not only became a Christian himself, but he made Rome a Christian empire. He moved the capital, and he redefined what it meant to be the church. And all my life, I've blamed the heresy of Christendom, Christian empire, on Constantine. But as I was doing research for this book, I came across the writings of Eusebius. Eusebius was the bishop of Caesarea. He was actually the person who baptized Constantine. And he, in the, first, in the, in the fourth century, began writing a book called Ecclesiastical History. It was actually a volume of 11 books. And he was trying to do something for the very first time that had never been done before, which was he was trying to write down the history of the church. The early books kind of cover, they start before Jesus with the killing of the children when Jesus was born. They kind of gloss over Jesus' life and pick it up with the stoning of Stephen and they establish the messiahship of Christ, and they go into detail regarding the persecution of the church and the martyrs of the church. And most of these um, books, they hold the martyrs in very high regard, right? These are people who are sharing in the suffering of Christ. They are very pious believers, and they hold them in very high regard. Now, in book eight, Eusebius introduces a new character called Constinius. Constinius is identified as a, a good man, um, someone who has been blessed by God. And then he introduces Constantine, his son. And he identifies Constantine as an emperor ordained by God. Now, this is a bit confounding because, again, up till this point, the emperors were the ones who were persecuting the church. And now, suddenly, we have Eusebius identifying Constantine as an emperor ordained by God, apparently there to bless the church. It's a bit confusing. Between books eight and nine, there's inserted a book. It's called The Book of the Martyrs. The Book of the Martyrs deals with what's called the Great Persecution. It's the bloodiest persecution in the history of the church. In the Book of the Martyrs, it identifies that the Great Persecution took place in Caesarea, which is where Eusebius was from. And he states in this book that he saw the death of many of the martyrs himself, and he actually knew several of them. So the Great Persecution touches Eusebius. And then coming out after that book, his attitude towards persecution begins to change rather radically. And now, instead of talking about the piety of the martyrs, now he's talking more about the emperors and what can be done to change this persecution, to end the persecution. Now, his book... It's called Ecclesiastical History, right? And if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, you would think you would be aware that you are not, your book doesn't have a conclusion, right? Because the history of the church will conclude when the bridegroom of the church returns. So the fact that you're writing the book is evidence it hasn't happened yet. So you're writing a prequel, you're writing a, a start, you're writing a, a forward to what might be a very, very, very long saga. But if you read to the final book and the final chapter and the final paragraph of Eusebius' understanding of ecclesiastical history, you will see that he actually does have a conclusion. He writes that the supreme God granted from heaven above the fruits of his piety, the trophies of victory over the wicked and nefarious tyrant with all his counselors and adherents, he cast prostrate at the feet of of Constantine, 
Not of Christ, but of Constantine. You see, what he's doing here is he's literally setting up Constantine as the savior of Rome. He's identifying Constantine as the savior of Rome. Why is he doing this? Well, because when the persecution touched him, he wanted a way to end the persecution. And if you want to end the persecution, he's focused on creating a Christian empire. And so he identified Constantine as a God-ordained emperor of Rome. Now, if you want to create a heretical Christian earthly empire that has a physical king here on earth, you know who your biggest obstacle is? It's Christ. Right? Because Christ was adamant that his kingdom was not of this earth. And so Constantine, in writing his version of ecclesiastical history to establish this, this notion of a Christian empire, he had to write Christ out of ecclesiastical history and insert Constantine. And that's exactly what he did. So now that we have this heresy, and Constantine bit, right? He converted to Christianity, and he made Rome Christian, fundamentally changing what it meant to be the church. Now instead of joining church through your baptism, your confession, and your discipleship, now you remember the church because of your citizenship in this earthly empire. Fundamentally changed what it meant to be the church. So now that we have this heresy known as Christendom, now we have to deal with the theologians of the day, right? What are they going to do? How are they going to respond to this heresy? Are they going to prophesy to it, or are they going to be complicit with it? So one of the major theologians of the 5th century was actually Augustine. St. Augustine is known for writing what's called a just war theory. Now, the just war theory has many purposes. One of it is to, is to help nations fight wars more justly. But it also is there to justify how Christian citizens of these Christian nations can go off and now kill in the name of God and country. Right? Because a plain text reading of Jesus' teaching doesn't allow this. And so if you want to justify that, you have to do some theological gymnastics. So I use the notion that Augustine was working on a just war theory as evidence that he was absolutely trying to be complicit with this heresy rather than prophesy to it. But I wanted to find where he crossed the line, right? Because when you cross the line with Jesus, he tends to call you out. And so um, I, looked, I read through his readings on just war. I read through his readings on two kingdoms. And while Augustine is fairly clear that the kingdom of heaven is not the same as the kingdom of man, he seems to have this notion that says, but having this Christian empire is better than not having it, so let's try to find and make it work. But I still couldn't find where he was crossing the line until I came across chapter 5 of his book on the correction of the Donatists. And in this book, Augustine is wrestling with a very perplexing question, which is, what is the role of a Christian king in a Christian empire? He's like, we've never had this before. We've always had pagan kings over us, and now we have a Christian king in a Christian empire, and what's his role? It's not a bad question, but he actually has a horrible premise, and the premise is that he accepts the notion of a Christian empire. And so he writes in the Correction of the Donatist that um, the role of the king is to prevent and chastise with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commands of the Lord. He says, for, a, for a, a, a man serves God in one way, in that he is a man, in another way, in that he is king. And so, but in that he is king, he serves him by enforcing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous and punishes what is the reverse. He then goes on to write that the, this Christian king in this Christian empire said it's better that men should be drawn um, should be driven to it by 
It is better indeed that men should be led to worship God by teaching than they should be driven to it by fear and punishment of pain. But we have found advantage, he said, in first compelling people by fear and pain so that later they might respond to teaching. So Augustine is arguing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to compel people through fear, punishment, and pain to obey the teachings of the scriptures and the commands of the church. Right? This is absolutely opposite of what Jesus was saying. If Jesus didn't have a problem calling St. Peter Satan, he would not have hesitated for a moment to look at Augustine and say, what are you thinking? You're not on the side of God, but of men. But that rebuke never came. And so as Augustine was complicit with the notion of Christian empire, this is what led into the Crusades. And the Crusades were about expanding the empire as well as protecting Jerusalem. Now, in the 13th century, we had another theologian, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was also wrestling with what it meant to deal with heretics. And he came to this conclusion. He said... Um, for in as much as it is a much graver matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money which supports temporal life, wherefore if forges of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they, as they are convicted of heresy, to not only be excommunicated but even condemned to death. So he is arguing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to kill people who don't keep the command of the church and the teachings of the scripture. Now, also in the 13th century, we have the term infidel being introduced. The infidel is a term of other. It's first applied to the Moors who become the Muslims. It's later applied to indigenous peoples, anyone who doesn't worship the God of the white European Christian male. Now that we have this other category, the subhuman category of the infidel, now we don't even need a just war theory to justify our wars because now we justify them based on theological grounds. We're fighting the other. We're fighting the enemies of Christ. And so it's out of this that in 1452, Pope Nicholas V writes out these words and says, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. This papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1450 and 1493, are collectively known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. This is the doctrine that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was literally lost at sea, land in this new world, which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. Right? The first sentence of the first chapter of our book on settling truths says you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can conquer those lands, You can steal those lands, but you cannot discover them unless your worldview informs you that the people already living there are not fully human. So this makes the doctrine of discovery a white male supremacist and Christian nationalist doctrine that is the direct fruit of a nation that has prostituted itself out to the empire. Now, in 1621, we celebrated the first Thanksgiving in this land. You've heard a lot of mythology about the first Thanksgiving. You've been told this was this kumbaya moment of a great potluck between native peoples and pilgrims. And we like to draw pictures of this in our elementary schools and reenact this in our, in our, um, in our school plays but we don't understand the entire story. So the first Thanksgiving took place at Plymouth Rock in 1621. Now in 1616 to 1619, in that very same part of the country, 
of the continent, there was what was known as the Great Dying. The Great Dying was almost like a plague that was brought over by the settlers and the explorers from Europe. And it came and just spread all over the continent, all over that, the, the northeast region of the country. It actually destroyed entire villages of native peoples, villages that literally a year ago or two years ago were thriving and full of life, were barren and empty with piles of bodies strewn about them as they died during this great dying. It was recorded in the Mayflower 400 um, that the most alarming period known as the Great Dying between 1616 to 1619, a mysterious disease regarding um, ravaged the region where the Wampanoag lived as their lands were explored in greater numbers. Entire villages were lost and only a fraction of the Wampanoag nation survived. In the winter of 1616 to 1617, an expedition dispatched by Sir Ferdinand Jorges found a region decimated by war and disease. The remaining people so sore afflicted with the plague that for that county there was in a manner vo left void of inhabitants. Two years later, another Englishman found um, an ancient plantation now completely empty with few inhabitants and those who did survive were suffering greatly. So we had this great dying take place from 1616 to 1619. Now in 1620, King George, this is the same King George who authorized the translation of the Bible, known as the King James Version of the Bible. Oh, I'm sorry, King James, not King George, King James. He made the Charter of New England. Now I want to read this charter to you. It's in the Old English, so it'll sound a little weird. James, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and to all these present shall come. Greetings, whereas upon the humble um, petition of divers of our well-disposed subjects that intended to make several plantations into the parts of America between the degree of 34 and 45. Within these late years, there hath by God's visitation reigned a wonderful plague together with many horrible slaughters and murderers committed against the savages and brutish people there, heretofore inhabiting in a manner to the utter destruction, devastation, and depopulation of that whole territory. So that there is not left for many leagues together in a manner any that do claim or challenge any kind of interest therein or any other superior lord or sovereign to make claim hereunto, whereby we in our judgment are persuaded and satisfied that the appointed time is come in which Almighty God, in his great goodness and bounty towards us and our people, hath thought fit and determined that those large and goodly territories, deserted as they were by their natural inhabitants, should be possessed and enjoyed by such of our subjects and people as heretofore have and hereafter show by his mercy and favor and by his powerful arm be directed and conducted thither. So King James saw the great plague and saw the devastation it brought upon the native and indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And instead of having mercy and compassion upon these people, he said, this is a sign that God destroyed these populations and has now given this land to white Europeans. Remember, Christian nationalism celebrates the destruction of the other. So in 16, and so the first Thanksgiving, which took place in 1621 at Plymouth Rock, one of the reasons it took place at Plymouth Rock is because that was one of the villages that was decimated by the great dying. And so it was empty. Now in 1630, John Winthrop, a Protestant pastor, was on board a ship and they landed in what's now called the Boston Harbor. They were actually here to plant the Boston Colony. And on board this ship, he preached a sermon titled A Model of Christian Charity. In his sermon, he referred to the colonists that he was with as a city upon a hill. He went on in his sermon 
to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the Spirit within the bonds of peace. These are just your basic Protestant church-going sermon exhortations. End of a sermon, he is trying to compel his congregants to heed his exhortations. And so he begins to quote from the verses of the Old Testament. One of the passages he quotes from is Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is the same passage we read earlier. And again, it says, but if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop says vast sea. Now, why would he say vast sea? Well, they didn't cross the river, they crossed an ocean. So what's he saying? Based on the teachings of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the land covenant with Old Testament Israel, they are standing on the shores of their promised lands, ready to go and take possession of them. I call this sermon the birth of the myth of American exceptionalism. This idea kind of begins to percolate from there. Now, one of the reasons they're making this notion of promised land, right? Because if you read past this passage, if you read the rest of the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, you will find that God is very specific in how his people are to take possession of their promised lands. It says that, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them as the Lord your God has commanded you. So promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. Now maybe you're thinking, Mr. Charles, this is the 1600s. We don't think that way anymore. I want to go back just a few years. Not very far. Let's go back to 2015 when Benjamin Netanyahu, who just got reelected as the Prime Minister of Israel a couple months ago, was visiting the United States. He was actually here to lobby against the nuclear deal that the Obama administration was negotiating with Iran. And he had to, was invited against protocol to speak to a joint session of Congress. And that Congress, just like today, was completely partisan. They weren't even talking to each other. And he had to get everyone on the same page behind him. So early in his speech, he said, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. If you want to know why the United States Congress has almost unanimous support for Israel from both the left and the right, it's because we have a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel. It has nothing to do with freedom or equality. We need Old Testament Israel's legacy of promised lands to justify what we did to Native Americans and African Americans. And the modern nation state of Israel needs our flourishing as a nation with a manifest destiny to justify what they're doing currently to Bedouins and Palestinians. We have a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel. It has nothing to do with freedom or equality. It's about justifying oppression. And in our case, even genocide. So in 1763 then, when we have 13 colonies along the East Coast, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains and he says to the colonies that are here that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upsets these colonists because they want access to those lands. And so a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they accuse the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. And they go on to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 
1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear the only reason the Founding Fathers used this inclusive term, all men, is because their definition of who was actually human was incredibly narrow. This makes our Declaration of Independence a systemically racist and white supremacist document. Now, a few years later, the founders wrote another document. They began this one with the words, we the people. This, of course, is the preamble to the Constitution. Again, it sounds inclusive. But if you keep reading, not even too much further, just down to Article 1, Section 2. This is the section of the Constitution that determines who is and who is not a part of this union, who is and who is not covered by this Constitution. If you read Article 1, Section 2, the first thing you have to note is that it never mentions women. Now, this is important because if you read the entire document, from the preamble through the 27th Amendment, you will find that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns. 51 he, him, and his. Who can run for office, who can hold office, even who's protected by the document. There's not a single female pronoun in the entire Constitution. So it never mentions women. Second, it specifically excludes natives. And third, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. So who's left? Well, in 1787, that literally left white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. You see, we don't think about this often enough. The purpose of the Constitution, the reason it was written, was to protect the interests of white landowning men. So we get upset today that women earn 60 to 70 cents to the dollar. This shouldn't be surprising. The Constitution's working. Right? We get upset that our prisons are filled with people of color. This is not shocking. The Constitution is working. People act outraged that in 2010, the Supreme Court sided with Citizens United and rules that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. This is what opens the door for super PACs, unlimited contributions to candidates. This is not surprising. The Constitution is merely doing what it was designed to do. It is protecting the interests of white landowning men. Now, maybe you're thinking, Mr. Charles, we corrected that. Well, we tried, right? Most people think the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. They think it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. That's actually not what it says. What it says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party has been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. This is the same criminal justice system that incarcerates the citizens of the United States today at the highest rate of any country in the world. And we incarcerate our people of color at three to five times the rate we incarcerate white people. We incarcerate Latinx and Hispanic people at 831 per 100,000, American Indians at 895, and black Americans at a rate of 2,306 per 100,000. White people are, of course, um, at a much more palatable, palatable number of 450 per 100,000. So we just, we have to acknowledge, right, today, in 2020, the 13th Amendment is being used as a way to take away the civil rights, primarily of people of color, within our nation, just like it was designed to do. It's putting enslavement and the dehumanization of people of color under the jurisdiction of our criminal justice system. We also passed the 14th Amendment. Most people think the 14th Amendment, and it actually was written in response to Article 1, Section 2, and again, the first section of the 14th Amendment is very inclusive. It talks about all persons, any person, extends rights of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the country, of the government, right? It's a very inclusive sounding amendment. Section two is much more prohibitive. It specifically excludes natives, specifically excludes natives, our women. And it leaves the doling out of civil rights, again, under the jurisdiction of our criminal justice system. The 
The Constitution of the United States is a systemically white supremacist, racist, and sexist document. Now again, you're thinking, Mr. Charles, this was a long time ago. We've gotten over that. Well, in 2020, Virginia ratified the ERA. They became the 38th state to ratify the ERA, which was the criteria to make it an amendment. In January of 2020, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the ERA, which was first proposed in 1972. Congress has the authority under Article 6 of the Constitution to set and change the deadlines for the ratification of uh, constitutional amendments and has done so on numerous occasions. So the problem was, is even though it got ratified in 2020, the deadline to ratify it had passed years ago. And so it didn't become the 28th Amendment. And so Senator Cain was pointing out on his website that we have precedent for actually changing the deadline so that this ratification could count and this could now become an amendment. And they said, um, for example, in 1992, the 27th Amendment of the Constitution um, prohibiting immediate congressional pay raises was successfully ratified after 203 years. The amendment was initially proposed as part of the original Bill of Rights in 1789. In January of this year, Senator Kane and Senator Warner announced a co-sponsorship of a bipartisan bill to affirm the ERA ratification and change the deadline. They proposed that. It passed the House. Remember, both the House and the Senate were under Democrat control. It passed the House and it was being waited to be voted on in the Senate. On January 6th, or December 6th of 2022, so end of the year last year, it was still sitting there. The Senate never moved on it. As a result, women are not explicitly protected under the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States is a systemically white supremacist, racist, and sexist document. And we decided in 2022 we didn't want to change that. In 1823, there was a Supreme Court case, Johnson versus McIntosh. This is two men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from the US government. The other one got the same land from a native tribe. They want to know who owned it. Who had the right to sell the land, the government or the tribe? The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. This was the John Marshall Court, considered one of the greatest Supreme Court jurists in US history. And they had to determine who had the right to sell the land, the tribe or the government. They need to understand and identify what was the legal precedent for land titles. They ruled it was discovery that gave title to the land. And then they went on to build this argument because that would imply, if discovery gave title to the land, it would imply that natives had the fee title to the land. So they made the argument later in that same ruling, and they said, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. So they're building the argument that because natives are less than human, they can't utilize this land right. Therefore, the right of discovery now falls to white Europeans. And so 1823 set the legal precedent for land titles as the doctrine of discovery. Now, this precedent 
and the doctrine of discovery are referenced by the Supreme Court by name in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. I have a TEDx talk out there that talks about the 2005 case. I'll go through a little bit of it here. So in 2005, actually, let me go back a little bit. So in the 1700s, when our nation became a nation, the United Indian Nation occupied about 6 million acres of land in what's now Central State, New York. The Washington administration reduced that land down to a few hundred thousand acres. And then they passed a law that said, this land is the land of the United Indian Nation and only the federal government can purchase these lands. The state of New York continued to illegally purchase the lands until all the Oneidas lands were bought up and they were moved out of the state into Oklahoma. In the 1990s, the United Indian Nation came back to New York and they repurchased some of their traditional lands on the open market. They paid full price for them. And they wanted to reestablish their traditional sovereignty over these lands. The city of Sherrill, where the lands were, didn't want that because they wanted the tax revenue from those lands. And so they sued the United Indian Nation in federal district court. The court actually ruled in favor of the Oneida. And so the city of Sherrill partnered with the county and appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals, and the original decision was upheld. So then they appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard the case in 2004 and released their opinion in 2005. In the first footnote of the case, where the referencing precedent, the Supreme Court references by name the doctrine of discovery. They then go on to argue that given the long-standing, um, distinctly non-Indian character of the area and its inhabitants and the regulatory authority constantly exercised by, by New York State and its counties and towns and the United's long delay in seeking judicial relief, we hold that the tribe cannot unilaterally revive its ancient sovereignty. They go on to reference another case that said it is impossible to rescind the session and restore the Indians to their former rights because the lands have been opened up to settlement, which was white settlement, and large portions of them are now in the possession of innumerable innocent purchasers. They then go on to build the argument that says, moreover, the properties here involved have greatly increased in value since the United sold them 200 years ago. Notably, it was not until lately that the United sought to regain ancient sovereignty over land converted from wilderness to become parts of a city like Sherrill. If that argument sounds familiar, it's because it's almost the same argument John Marshall made in 1823. The only difference is that 2005 case doesn't use the word savages. But it says we converted your land to wilderness and we can't give it back to you. From wilderness to, to a city and now we can't give it back to you. So they conclude and they reverse the decision of the lower courts. We reject the unification theory of the Oneida Indian Nation and the U.S. Gov government and hold that standards of federal Indian law, again, footnote one, doctrine of discovery, and federal equity practice preclude the tribe from rekindling embers of sovereignty that long ago grew cold. Again, this is probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime. And it was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, this is shocking to people because Ruth has the legacy of being a voice of dissent on an increasingly conservative Supreme Court. She was fighting for the rights of the marginalized, which she did and which she was. The problem is, is because land titles to this day are based on the legal understanding, not of treaties, but that natives are savages. This makes white supremacy a bipartisan value, which Ruth demonstrated in her opinion that she wrote in 2005.
So the United States Supreme Court agrees that the Constitution of the United States is a systemically racist, sexist, and white supremacist document. And this isn't the first time, right? It was in 1857 that they concluded in Dred Scott that this Constitution and our founding documents did not apply to formerly enslaved peoples. Now, in our Constitution, Article 6, Clause 2 is known as the Supremacy Clause. It states that the Constitution and treaties are the supreme law of the land, right? So if there's ever confusion about what to do and what side is right, the supreme law of the land rests with what the Constitution says and what treaties were made. And I want to talk to you about a Supreme Court case just from a couple years ago, 2020. It was McGirt versus the state of Oklahoma. To understand this case, you have to understand a few components of Indian law. So when a Native American commits a crime against another Native American on a reservation, the jurisdiction for that crime falls to the federal courts. So McGirt, a Native man, committed a crime against another Native person in the city of Tulsa in Oklahoma. And he was tried in the state court. And he was found guilty. And he appealed his conviction because he said, you tried me in the wrong court. By treaty, Tulsa is a part of a reservation. Therefore, I should have been tried in a federal court, not a state court. The state of Oklahoma responded and said, we have never in all of our existence as a state treated Tulsa as a reservation. And the courts have since agreed with us. Therefore, we had every right and the jurisdiction to try you in our state courts. And so the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The case was heard in 2019. The opinion came out in 2020. It was actually Neil Gorsuch, who was a Trump appointee, who wrote the opinion. And Neil Gorsuch is actually one of the better minds regarding Indian law on the Supreme Court. He dealt with a lot of Indian law cases in Colorado, where he served on the federal courts. And uh, he has a lot of experience. And he's actually one of the better minds on the Supreme Court to deal with Indian law. And so he wrote this opinion. And he actually ruled in favor of McGirt. He stated that the state does not have the right to break a treaty, and the courts do not have the right to break a treaty. And therefore, he said, for judicial purposes, Tulsa and most of eastern Oklahoma is actually a reservation. This meant now that the state of Oklahoma had to retry hundreds of cases that they had previously tried in state court, they now had to retry in federal court. Most of Indian country saw this as a huge victory. But I don't trust the Supreme Court. So the day the ruling came out, I was actually running for president. I took the day off the campaign trail and I read the entire opinion. The entire thing. And sure enough, true to form, the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch, put some Easter eggs in his ruling to white supremacy. One of the things that was written is he said, to determine whether a tribe continues to hold a reservation, there is only one place we may look. Not the treaties, the acts of Congress. This court long ago held that the legislature wields significant constitutional authority when it comes to tribal relations, possessing even the authority to breach its own promises and treaties. He goes on to write that only Congress can divest a, reser a reservation of its land and diminish its boundaries, so it's no matter how many other promises to a tribe the federal government has already made, if Congress wishes to break the promise of a reservation, it must say so. So basically what he's saying is he's telling the state of Oklahoma, you're barking up the wrong tree. If you want to have jurisdiction over this land, don't fight it in court. You don't have the right to change it. The courts don't have the right to change it. Only Congress can change it. And later he writes, whenever Congress can muster the will, all they have to do is say the words. And they can break this treaty, and there's nothing that anyone, including the Supreme Court, will have to do, will, will have to say about it. This is a complete contrary 
to the supremacy clause that says treaties are the supreme law of the land. And in regards to Indian treaties, the Supreme Court is ruling that no, Congress is the supreme law of the land, not treaties. This is why in 1823 and in 2005, when natives are fighting for sovereignty over our lands, the Supreme Court does not reference a treaty because all the treaties they made with native nations have been broken. What they reference is the doctrine of discovery. You're not fully human. You can't have sovereign rights over these lands. So now that we have God's permission as a nation to commit genocide, we have a dehumanizing Declaration of Independence, a racist, a sexist, and a white supremacist constitution, and the agreement of the Supreme Court that these racist, sexist, and white supremacist notions are true, so they're legal. Now we have to talk about some military history. I want to look at the history of the United States during the 19th century. This is the century known as our century of expansion. This is the century we add about 30 new states to the Union. I made this chart. This chart is a, is, a, is a chart of U.S. history from 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue is a year I found we were in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year I found we were fighting against native nations. These are lists of the wars I found we fought primarily during the 19th century against native nations. Clearly, this is not a century of expansion, right? This is a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It's during this century that we passed the Indian Removal Act. This is the act of Congress that, in practice, gave the U.S. military the right by force to remove Native nations from their lands in the east to empty lands further in the west. This resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Long Walk for the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache, all told, about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation, and tens of thousands of Native peoples died as a direct result of the Indian Removal Act. In 1862, we had the hanging of the Dakota 38. In 1863, we had the largest Indian massacre in our nation's history with the Bear River Massacre of the Shoshone in northern um, Utah and southern Idaho. In 1879, we had the, um, the start of Indian boarding schools. The purpose of these schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. Native children were taken from their homes. They were put into these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages and punished for practicing their culture. The last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. The stories of abuse that I've heard personally, mental, physical, emotional, and sexual that happened in these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. In 1890, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee. This is a bit more famous massacre. We talk about it a little bit in our history books, at least we mention it by name, but we don't talk about the details. In 1890, the U.S. government was in negotiation with the Dakota people and they were trying to negotiate the surrender of a Dakota chief. They met at Wounded Knee. Both sides were heavily armed and neither side trusted each other. No one knows what happened, who fired the first shot. Was it a native warrior? Was it a US soldier? No one knows. But someone fired a shot and chaos just broke out. The U.S. government had several of these what are called Hotchkiss cannons there. They fire, fire several rounds a minute. They're accurate up to a few hundred yards. They begin raining bullets down on the Dakota people. Now, at Wounded Knee, there is a ravine, kind of a little in a ditch that most of the Dakota people ran into, the women and children especially, to seek shelter from these guns. Now, one of the things we don't talk about with Wounded Knee is that the U.S. Congress awarded 20 Congressional Medals of Honor to the U.S. soldiers who participated in this massacre. And three of those medals 
The one for William Austin, the one for John Gresham, and the one for Albert McMillan were awarded specifically for their role in helping to flush the Dakota people out of the ravine so they could be shot down by the guns from above. In 1840, this is what our nation looked like. The dark lands to the east are established states. The other lands, lighter lands to the west, are either territories or even uncharted lands. If you go online and look it up, you can actually find medals of honor awarded by the U.S. Congress by war and by conflict. And if you look up medals of honor for the Indian War campaigns, you will find that between 1839 and 1898, the U.S. Congress awards 425 medals of honor to U.S. soldiers who participated in the Indian War campaigns. End of that period, this is what our nation looked like. You can see we've expanded all the way to the West. We've completed our manifest destiny. During this period, the native population, are, during this period, the um, white population exploded from 5.3 million to 76.2 million. And the native population collapsed from 600,000 to 237,000. If you're doing your math, that's a 61.47% rate of genocide. If you're comparing your math, that's higher than the rate of genocide that Nazi Germany had over the Jews in World War II. So there's no other way to say it. Between 1839 and 1898, the US Congress awards 425 medals of honor for the ethnic cleansing of native nations and the genocide of indigenous peoples. Remember, Christian nationalism celebrates the destruction of the other. And we knew what we were doing. In January of 1851, the first governor of California, he was in his state of the state address, he gave this quote. He said that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct, must be expected. While we cannot continue to, while we cannot, while we cannot anticipate the results, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or the wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying famine's broken out and we can't feed these people. And he's not saying disease has struck and we can't stop its spread. He's literally saying we cannot stop killing these people until we complete our manifest destiny. And this, of course, is perfectly in line with the notion of promised lands. In Joshua 10, we are told that Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. If we look at the population growth globally from 1500 to 1900, we see that the world population went from 400, 480 million to 1.6 billion for a 3.39% rate of growth. Europe went from 82 million to 300 million for a 3.65 rate of growth. Africa, even with the hordes of the slave trade, went from 63 million to 123 million for a 1.782 rate of growth. The United States went from zero, humans apparently, because the rest of us were savages, to 76.2 million. And the native population during that same period collapsed. And six million is a incredibly conservative estimate for a continental United States in 1500, down to a low of 237,000, which is a 0.0395 rate of growth, which is actually a rate of genocide of 96.05%. I wanna pause for a moment here. And I want to just give you a chance to take a little breath. I'd like you to respond to me. I don't want to hear your whole story. And uh, 
I just want to hear two or three words from you. There's no right answer, nor is there a wrong answer. There's no good answer, nor is there a bad answer. All I want you to do is emote for me. Tell me in two or three words or less, how does this history make you feel? What emotions are in you right now? Yes. Two or three words. Despair? Disturbed and despair. Anyone else? Sadness and disappointment. Anyone else? Anything coming in online? Um, no, thank you for asking. Okay. It's important to acknowledge this. It's important that we verbalize these things. Why? Because there's a reason we don't talk about this history. There's a reason we don't bring it up. It's because we don't know what to do with this. And so acknowledging how it makes us feel is very, very, very important. We're getting into the final maybe two thirds of our lecture here, but unfortunately it's gonna get worse before it gets better. So there's a few more things I wanna talk about. Now, if you've read On Selling Truth, there are two chapters that you probably remember very distinctly in this book. They're chapters nine and 10. In chapters nine and 10, we deal with the understanding that the victors write the history. And we think that's a good thing. So let's imagine, just for a moment, if you will, imagine with me. Let's pretend that Nazi Germany wins World War II. Okay? How do you think, had Nazi Germany won World War II, how do you think their historians would have recorded the legacy of Adolf Hitler? What would they have said about him? Had Nazi Germany won World War II, how would Nazi historians have recorded the legacy of Adolf Hitler? Positively or negatively? Positively. How would they have recorded the details of the Holocaust? Yeah. I mean, we have Holocaust deniers today. Imagine if they won the war, right? What Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. I want to take that understanding and apply it to this man. As race relations have gotten worse in the United States in the past several decades, the stock of Abraham Lincoln has risen. He is now by very large numbers, considered the greatest president in our nation's history. Doesn't matter if you're white or a person of color, doesn't matter if you're, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, almost across the board, Abraham Lincoln is considered one of our nation's greatest presidents. Our first black president, Barack Obama, was sworn in on the Lincoln Bible. The Republicans love to remind the nation that they are the party of Lincoln and that they, they say they still believe in his legacy and in his, and, and in his values. But because the victors write the history, and because we know what happens when the victors write the history, the challenge we face as a country is that the United States of America has never lost a war that matters. We've never really been invaded. We've never given up large tracts of land. We've never had to surrender. We've never been disarmed. We've never had a regime change. We've never borne the scorn of the global community. We've never lost a war that matters. Technically, the Korean War is still on. 
We pulled out of Vietnam, we pulled out of Afghanistan, but we didn't lose any land there. We have won every major military conflict we have ever been in throughout our entire history, 250 plus years. And as a result, we don't have a clue who this man is. Abraham Lincoln is actually a blatant white supremacist. Let me introduce you to him the same way he introduced himself to the country when he was running for the Senate in 1858. It was known back then that he was against chattel slavery. But right, they had just had the Dred Scott decision in 1857. And just like Roe versus Wade was the debate of this midterm election, Dred Scott was the debate of the 1858 midterm election. And so people didn't want to know how he stood on chattel slavery. They wanted to know how he felt about the citizenship and the humanity of black people. And so in his introduction, as he was letting the nation get to know him, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, this is what Lincoln said. I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the races living together in terms of social and political equality, and inasmuch as they cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. If you read the debates between Lincoln and Judge Douglas, you will find they disagreed on chattel slavery, but they absolutely agreed on white supremacy. Absolutely agreed on white supremacy. They disagreed. Douglas thought we needed slavery to keep white supremacy intact. Lincoln was fairly confident we could keep white supremacy intact even without chattel slavery. That was their disagreement. He lost that election, ran for president, and was elected in 1860. The morning of his inauguration, the Senate was in a tizzy because there were several states threatening to secede from the Union because of Lincoln's stance on chattel slavery. And so the Senate was doing everything it could to try and keep the Union together. And so early that morning, they passed what was called the Corwin Amendment. The Corwin Amendment said no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of the state. So the Corwin Amendment constitutionally protected slavery in the states where it already existed. And they passed that in the morning of Lincoln's inauguration. Now in his inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln actually mentioned this amendment. He said, apprehension seems to exist among the peoples of the Southern states that by the ascension of a Republican administration, their property, their enslaved peoples, and their peace and personal insecurity are endangered. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found in the nearly all of the published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote from one of those speeches when I declare that I have no purpose. And he begins to quote himself from the Lincoln Douglas debates. He goes on to say, I understand a proposed amendment to the constitution to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the, doc, with the domestic institutions of the states, including that of persons held to service, to avoid misconstruction of what I have said, holding such a provision to now by implied constitutional law, I have no objection to it being made express and irrevocable. 
So he is in favor of constitutionally protecting enslavement in states where it already exists. Now, there were actually four states that never seceded from the Union, but allowed enslavement. These are the states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And so Lincoln was inaugurated, obviously states seceded from the Union, and soon we had a Confederacy and the Union, and we were at a civil war. And in 1862, Horace Greeley, who was the editor of the New York Tribune, he wrote a scathing op-ed calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. This was something Lincoln had promised during his campaign. And in 1862, Horace Greeley wrote this op-ed saying, do it now. Now, Lincoln already had the Emancipation Proclamation written. It was sitting in his desk. But he was afraid of these four states that had not seceded from the Union and allowed enslavement. And so he published a letter, and in that letter he said, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. So his response to Horace Greeley saying emancipate the slaves and his response to comfort those slave owners in these northern states was I'm not doing this because I give a crap about black lives. I'm doing this to preserve the union. That is my highest objective and my goal. Black lives do not matter in this debate. January 1st of 1863, we released the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, if you ever read it, is very specific about where it frees the slaves. They are actually freed, are, they are um, freed in Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. He also lists a bunch of counties where they are freed, and he excludes a bunch of other counties, and he excludes Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And he writes that accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. Not only did he not free enslaved people in the northern states, he did not free them in counties where the Union had already won in the South. Those slaves didn't get their freedom until after Lincoln was assassinated. I want to talk about the capstone of his legacy, which is the 13th Amendment. Again, most people think the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. We think it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist. To understand the 13th Amendment, you have to understand Lincoln, right? During the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he was asked if the Declaration of Independence applies to the black race. And his response was, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. Right? He's not saying some people are taller and some people are more well-read. He's saying one group of people is superior and another is inferior, and he's already made it very clear which race he believes is the superior race. He was later asked about making citizens of black people. And he says, Judge Douglas has told you that he has not been able to get an answer from me about where I stand on Negro citizenship. He shall have no, connect, no occasion to ever ask it again, for I tell him very plainly, I am not in favor of Negro citizenship. It's my opinion that the different states have the power to make a Negro a citizen under the Constitution if they choose, but if the state of Illinois had that power, I should be opposed to the exercise of it. 
And even though he's in the North, which apparently is the nation, the side that loves black people, people are cheering and saying good, good applause. First of all, we have to point out that Abraham Lincoln is publicly stating he agrees with the Dred Scott decision. He agrees with that decision. Second, this is why the amendment has a clause in it that keeps slavery legal in prison. This is why the 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Abraham Lincoln had no intention of making voters and jurors of Negroes. Had no intention of allowing them to hold office or to intermarry. He didn't give a crap about black people. So it's no surprise that his, he was even willing to constitutionally protect enslavement in states where it already existed, and his Emancipation Proclamation did not free enslaved peoples, not only in the North, but even in the Southern territories they had won the war at already. Abraham Lincoln was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist. But we already knew this, right? We all knew the Lincoln-Douglas debates were bad. We didn't have the guts to read them. But we knew they said some things we didn't want to hear. We knew this, right? If you go to the Lincoln Memorial, at the Lincoln Memorial, there's a small room about this, half the size of this room. It's a museum at the base of the memorial. It's right near the bathroom. On that wall of the museum, there are plaques like this with different sayings and writings by Abraham Lincoln about different parts of his legacy. On one wall, there's these list of five marble stones. They're about four feet tall, about two and a half feet wide. Etched on these stones are different thoughts of Abraham Lincoln on the Union. And in the middle of that wall is this plaque that says, I would save the Union. My paramount object in this struggle is not to save or destroy slavery, it's to preserve the Union. If I could save him without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could save him by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save by freeing someone, leaving others alone, I would also do that. There is a plaque hanging at the Lincoln Memorial announcing to every American and the world that Abraham Lincoln didn't give a crap about black lives. And in his opinion, they did not matter. Now I want to tell you some things we don't know about Lincoln. We knew all this. We didn't know the specifics, but we knew. We just didn't want to face it. But there's other things about Lincoln that we don't want to know, period. In 1862, the spring and summer, Abraham Lincoln signed two bills. He signed the Pacific Railway Act, and he signed the Homestead Act. The Pacific Railway Act allocated the land and the resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. The Homestead Act allocated 160 acres to anyone willing to go west and homestead for five years. So this was spring and summer of 1862. In the fall of 1862, the Dakota people were in a quandary. Previously, they had signed a treaty with the U.S. government, giving up large tracts of their land in exchange for resources to make it through the harsh Minnesota winters. They had signed the treaty about a year and a half, two years earlier, and in the last winter it was very harsh, and the U.S. government was not meeting their treaty obligations. As they were going into the fall, they were concerned about what was going to happen to them this next year and this next winter, and one day some of their warriors, their young men were out, and they came across a white settlement, and they decided to go in and steal some eggs. During the, the time of the theft, they were discovered, and there was a skirmish, and they killed some of the settlers. They went back to their people. They explained to them what they did. And there was a very heated debate about do they go and make amends or do they go to war? And in the end, the Dakota people decided they should go to war because they did not believe the U.S. government was going to meet their treaty obligations. And so this led to the Dakota War of 1862. It was a 30-day war. It was very bloody, a lot of death on both sides. End of the war, half of the native Warriors fled north into Canada, and the other half surrendered. Those who surrendered were immediately put into military tribunals. They were now being tried by the very men they were fighting. 
These trials were in a language they didn't understand. Witnesses were shared. The trials last merely a few minutes. And of the trials, almost 400 of them were found guilty and condemned to death. No one had the gut to bring about this order. So it got passed up the chain of command all the way to Lincoln. Even he couldn't bring himself to do it. But he had to make a decision. He could have ordered retrials, as the trials they got were clearly shams. But he didn't. Instead, he changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. Under his new criteria, only two of the native warriors were going to die. Now he was afraid of his white settlers because they were already uprising because of this leniency. And they were starting to attack and take things into their own hands. And so a second time, Lincoln did not order retrials. He changed the criteria of a, again of what warranted a death sentence and landed on the magic number of 38. So the day after Christmas, 1862, hundreds of Minnesotans came out and they watched as the largest mass execution in the history of our nation took place with the hanging of the Dakota 38. January 29 of 1863, I'll just read this for you. In the frigid dawn of January 29, 1863, Segowich, a leader among the Shoshone of Big of Bia Ogai, Big River in what is now Idaho, stepped outside his lodge and saw a curious band of, of fog moving down the bluff towards him across a half-frozen river. The mist was no fog, though. It was steam rising from the sub -zero, in the sub-zero from hundreds of U.S. Army foot soldiers and cavalry and their horses. The Army was coming for his people. Over the next four hours, the 200 soldiers under Colonel Patrick Connor's command killed 250 or more Shoshone, including at least 90 women, children, and infants. The Shoshone were shot, stabbed, and battered to death. Some were driven into the icy river to drown or freeze. This was the deadliest Native American massacre in U.S. history of the Shoshone Nation in January 29 of 1863. In February of 1863, Abraham Lincoln nullified all of the treaties of the Native nations in Minnesota. In March of 1863, without treaty or negotiation, he ordered the removal of all the Native peoples from the state of Minnesota. They were put into wagons, they were herded by foot, they were marched out of the city, they were put on barges and shipped out into the Dakota territories to the west. They were put on a reservation that was not sustainable for them. It was a very oppressive, unjust, and even bloody removal. In the fall of 1863, one of Abraham Lincoln's generals, General Carleton, gave this order, and he said, Henceforth, every Navajo, this is in the Southwest, male is to be killed or taken prisoner on sight. Say to them, go to the Bosquedondo, or we will pursue you and destroy you. We will not make peace with you on any other terms. This war shall be pursued until you cease to exist or you move. There can be no other talk on the subject. Kit Carson went through the Navajo lands. He rounded up our people. He destroyed our livestock. He burned our hogans. He burned our crops. He chased around our people and captured them. You can see this bill here. They had put in a proposal to build a reservation. They called it a reservation at Bosquedondo. You can see in the bottom that reservation was approved on January of 1864 by none other than Abraham Lincoln. Historian Raymond Friday Locke in his book, The Navajo, records that by the middle of December, most of the aged and the weak had died. There is hardly a Navajo family that cannot remember tales of an aged grandfather, a pregnant mother, or a lame child that had to be left behind um, when the camp had to be quickly deserted. The patrols were not interested in taking captives. It was too much trouble to transport them back to the forts. Any Navajo they saw was shot on sight. 
Mothers were sometimes forced to suffocate their hungry, crying babies to keep their families from being discovered and butchered by an army patrol. Nearly 10,000 Navajo men, women, and children were rounded up. They were marched down to Bosco Dondo. Hundreds of our people died of exposure and starvation along the way, and nearly a quarter of our people died while imprisoned in what can only be called a death camp. In the summer of 1864, Abraham Lincoln signed a second version of the Pacific Railway Act, which doubled the land and resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway, and it gave railway companies the mineral rights to the ground to financially incentivize them to work faster and complete the railway quicker. In November of 1864, the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho were on their reservation lands in eastern Colorado. They were waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag to show they were there peacefully. A U.S. Army, a Union Army led by a Methodist pastor came over the hill. The native warriors were out hunting that day, and so it was the men, women, and children at the camp, and he ordered all of them slaughtered. It was later reported and even acknowledged by the state that later that day, the soldiers paraded the genitalia of the native peoples down the streets of Denver in celebration of this massacre. So in two and a half years, we had the Dakota 38 and the removal from Minnesota. We had the Bear River Massacre in Idaho and Northern Utah. We had the Navajo Long Walk in Southwest and we had the Sand Creek Massacre in Eastern Colorado. In his annual message in 1864, Abraham Lincoln pointed out that 1.5 million acres were entered under the Homestead Law and that the great enterprise of connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific States by railway and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. By the way, this annual message was given in early December of 1864, less than 10 days after the, Bear River, or the Sand Creek Massacre took place in late November of 1864. He's already celebrating it. It makes more sense when you can see this on a map. So this is a map of the Transcontinental Railway. The primary route had made it to Omaha, Nebraska. It had to go through, um, it had to go through Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and come out near San Francisco. We had a northern route that had to go through um, Minnesota and uh, North Dakota, Idaho, um, Montana, and come out near Seattle, Washington, and a southern route going through the, the territory of New Mexico and territory of Arizona and come out near Los Angeles, California. So after the removal of the Dakota 38, of the Dakota and the hanging of the Dakota 38 in Minnesota, after the Sand Creek Massacre, of the Cheyenne Arapaho in Eastern Colorado, after the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache being removed through the Long Walk in the Southwest, and after the Bear River Massacre in Northern um, Utah and Southern Idaho. And that massacre literally took place just a few miles from where the Golden Spike was laid years later, completing the Chungan Railway. You can see Abraham Lincoln was just ethnically cleansing the primary routes of the Transcontinental Railway. Abraham Lincoln was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist and one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. He's also the president who brought Thanksgiving into the modern era. Prior, prior to his administration, Thanksgiving was more of a regional thing and it was celebrated at different times during the fall. Um, it was on different areas, and he issued a proclamation in both 1863 and in 1864, making Thanksgiving a national holiday with a national proclamation. The proclamation he gave in 1863 said, needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have been scattered, have been arrested, have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements. The axe, not the gun. 
and the mines as well of iron and coal and of the precious metals have yielded even abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased and the country rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is, perm is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High. So as Abraham Lincoln was going through ethnically cleansing the routes of the Transcendental Railway, he stopped twice and caused, paused, and made a call for the nation to hold a national day of thanksgiving, giving praise to God for the fruits of the genocide he was actively committing. It's no wonder that the memorial for Lincoln in the heart of DC is based off a temple in Greece, right? He's a God in our minds. Again, we have to remember Christian nationalism celebrates the destruction of the other. I wanna talk a bit more about Thanksgiving and make it a bit more personal to you. So one of the things is we celebrate Thanksgiving. We have that first Thanksgiving in 1621. We have Lincoln making Thanksgiving about the fruits of genocide. And one of the things that we've always connected with Thanksgiving in the last 50 to 75 years has been football. It's actually one of the things that we like to do on football. There's two teams that play almost every year on Thanksgiving, right? We have the Detroit Lions who've been playing on Thanksgiving for almost 100 years. And we have the Dallas Cowboys, who have played pretty much every year for the past 50 so years. Cowboys are considered America's team. They look, they're Cowboys. On a whim, literally on a whim, a couple years ago, I decided, I was just curious. I'm like, I wonder who they played most frequently on Thanksgiving Day. I was curious. So I, 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 I'm looked it up and I made this chart. You can see they played a lot of teams once or twice. They had, you know, uh, LA Chargers. They played the Miami Dolphins about four or five times. They played the Oakland Raiders two or three times. They played uh, Seattle Seahawks about three times. They played the St. Louis Cardinals four times. But there's one team they played nine times. You want to guess what team that was? Washington Redskins. Nine times, more than any, almost double the highest team, and almost nine to ten times more than most other teams. Why? Why would they play the Redskins on Thanksgiving Day over and over and over again? Right? The NFL knows their product. Right? They are well aware the Super Bowl is like a national holiday. Right? Even church is empty on the Super Bowl day, especially if there's a local team playing. Right? They know their product. They know how to market. They know how to sell it. They know what the American people want. So why do they have the Cowboys playing the Washington Redskins year after year after year after year after year, more than double more than any other team and almost 10 times more than most teams? Maybe they're just a good rivalry, right? Maybe it's really close, good games. Well, if you look back at all these times, a, you'll see that the Cowboys won eight of those nine times. So they won every, almost every single time. Their margin of victory was by almost a touchdown. So it wasn't even a very close nail-biting game. So why would they do this then? Well, they know their market. They know what the American people want. And apparently what the American people want after they finish their Thanksgiving, again, thanking God for the genocide of Native peoples, thank you, Abraham Lincoln, they like to sit down and watch Cowboys massacre Indians. Right? I found this meme. It didn't even take very long to find it, right? Some people hate Trump. Some people hate Hillary. Everybody hates the Redskins.
These are just the subtle ways we do things as a nation. The things we accept, the things that happen around us, we're not even aware of. So again, I want to I go back to this conversation about Christian nationalism. I just want to deeply help impact you on how much this is a bipartisan value because we've been having this huge debate about it these past few weeks, past few years. Right? We had a two-year-long commission looking at, the, at the, the uprising, the insurrection, at the Capitol building. Now, the problem we have as a nation is that we actually, we're A, first of all, we're a very young nation, right? We're, we're not very old. And as far as nations go, I would put us at a pre-tween, a, a, a pre-teen at best. Now, the problem is, is while we're a pre-teen, we are a very wealthy and incredibly well-armed pre-teen. But we still have all of the hormonal challenges that preteens have of trying to get used to their gaining strength and their varied emotions and all their things, all the problems you have as you raise your preteens, right? And you know the challenges. That's what the U.S. struggles with, but we're doing it with a ton of money and a ton of weapons, okay? Now, as a nation, we actually have a very simplistic political system. It's not very complex. We have a two-party system. And what our two-party system does is it makes every dialogue binary. There's a right or a wrong to every single problem. And the solution, nine times out of ten, is to simply obstruct your opponent until you can get them out of office and insert someone into your, of your party into office. That's the entire political strategy for the past several decades. So we have a very, very, very simplistic two-party system. On top of that, we have a media that exacerbates the problem, right? Most of us are aware of what's called the Fox News bubble. Maybe you're aware of it because you have family members who live in it, or maybe you exist in it yourself. Now, the interesting thing about the Fox News bubble is it exists for a reason, right? I actually study media a lot, and I, I, I do research on the bias of media. And except for the Wall Street Journal and Fox News, there's very few mainstream media outlets that lean right. Almost everything leans left. Even AP, NPR, and PBS lean left. CBS, ABC, NBC, they all lean left. CNN and MSNBC, they are actually as partisan on the other extreme as Fox News is. And so not only do we have a Fox News bubble on the right, but we have a CNN and MSNBC news bubble on the left. And both of these news bubbles exist to keep their party in office, and they exist to make you angry and afraid about your opponent. That's the whole reason they exist. And so they suck you into this news bowl. Has anyone watched, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever watched either Fox News or CNN for like 24 hours straight, right? You end up wanting to do damage to somebody, right? You feel afraid, you feel paranoid, you start listening to Sean Hannity or Laura Meadows, right? And you're just like, ah! These bubbles exist for a reason. And Donald Trump lived, he set up camp in the Fox News bubble. And Joe Biden has stated that he exists within the CNN, MSNBC news bubble. That is his primary source of news. So because of this, we are not equipped to have a conversation about something as foundational and important as white Christian nationalism. Because the only solutions we have and are given in our given us options to think about, is just obstruct the other party until you can get back in office. That's all it is. So, this image has been seared into your brain, correct? I didn't have to show it to you. I could just set it, and you would have, you would have pictured it right away. This was shown on every major media outlet for months, right? This was back in, in uh, Jan, June 1st of 2020, not long after the lynching of George Floyd, there were protests going on at Lafayette Park, which is the park right in front of the White House. They were going on every day. That morning, law enforcement goes into Lafayette Park and they aggressively clear the park of all protesters. 
Later that day, Donald Trump walks out, walks in front of the church, holds up his Bible upside down at first, corrects it, holds it up the right way, takes a picture, says almost nothing, and then walks back. And because the majority of media leans left, he was immediately called out for exactly what he was doing, which is he was giving a dog whistle to white Christian nationalism. Removing people who were protesting racial violence by law enforcement, holding up, holding up his body. He didn't have to say much or anything at all. This was absolutely a dog whistle to white Christian nationalism, and he knew what he was doing. His handlers knew what he was doing. The media knew what he was doing, and he was called out for it. Now, during the 2020 election, Joe Biden ran as the anti-Trump, right? He talked about bringing civility back into the White House. He was tired of Trump doing foreign policy on Twitter. He was tired of him simplistically insulting both our allies and our enemies. And he said, if you elect me, I will bring civility back into the White House. And he was tested soon after he was elected because on August 26th of 2021, there was a terrorist attack in Afghanistan. And several U.S. service members lost their lives in this terrorist attack. And Joe Biden had to make a statement. So in his statement, so what he said, he said, to those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. Now, had I not told you those were Joe Biden's words, who would have thought they were Trump's words? Right? Exactly the same as what the other guy said. Just a few months ago, everyone in the Democratic Party was up in arms because Vladimir Putin said that he would use every measure at his command to protect the Russian territories. And we said, as a nation, how can you say that? You're so irresponsible. You're a nuclear power. You cannot talk that way. You cannot threaten nuclear war. But this is how our president spoke a year ago. No one said anything. Again, most of the media leans left. So we have to know this is how he started his speech. He then thanks the commanders in the field and other people who are there helping to bring resolution to this attack, expresses his gratitude for that. And then he says, those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah when the Lord says, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? And the American military has been answering for a long time. Here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. In his State of the Union, Joe Biden used the word sacred twice. He used it once in reference to the Capitol building. This was a sacred space where he gave a speech. He also talked about our sacred obligation to care for our veterans. I do not deny we have an absolute moral obligation to take better care of our veterans, but he brought in the aspect of the divine. He said sacred. Why would he bring in sacred? Because Joe Biden believes that the U.S. Army is the army of the Lord, answering a prophetic call on par with that of Isaiah the prophet. If you believe white Christian nationalism is a partisan problem. Turn off Fox News. Turn off CNN. And start hunting your news instead of finding it in your algorithm. Right? Fox News, CNN's not going to tell you this because it would destroy their advertising revenue. And Fox News doesn't have the theological acumen to make this kind of a statement. They don't know what's going on. Right? But these are the things we have to be aware of. This is, this is a bipartisan value. We have to understand that. White Christian nationalism is a bipartisan value that was written into the foundations of our nation, and it has created a dysfunctional theological imagination for all U.S. citizens. Even in the church. Even in the church, after 9-11, 
after, depending on if your church leans leans right or left, after 9-11, many churches, when they were afraid at a national level, turn to find comfort in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. I've heard this prayed, I've heard this preached, I've heard this read. Doesn't matter if it's left or right-leaning church. We use this over and over and over again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and what? Heal their land. Right? This statement was given at the dedication of the temple when God was reiterating the threats and promises of his land covenant with the people of Israel. But the American church prays this prayer over and over. Every time we get afraid, we pray this prayer. You are not God's chosen people. Turtle Island is not your promised land. It's just that clear. It's just that basic. We cannot pray this prayer. Yes, we should turn from our wicked ways. Yes, we should seek the face of God. Yes, we should pray. If this is your faith tradition, absolutely. But don't expect God to heal your land. God did not give you this land. Your nation stole it through a doctrine of discovery, ethnically cleansed it, and used enslaved peoples to build it up. Right? If you you have a a, a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew, and they steal a bike, okay, they steal a bike, and they're joyriding on this bike, and they're, they're riding around town, and they crash it, and they destroy the bike and scrape up themselves, Right? They're bloody bloody and bruised, and the bike's broken. And you go out and you find them. Now, you will probably pick them up. You will probably brush off their, their, their scrapes. You'll probably bandage their wounds. You'll probably comfort them. And they come back to you, and, you know, you'll probably do these things to help them. But do you let them keep the bike? No. Why? It's not their bike. They stole it. Yeah, it's, it's a shame they, they crashed. It's a shame they got hurt. It's a shame that you want to make it better, but you don't let them keep the bike because they stole it. This is where we as a nation, we have, to, we have to, as a church, we have to understand who we are. We are not the people of Israel. We are not God's chosen people. We do not have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. These are not Europeans' promised lands. One of the things I am working so hard towards is I believe our nation needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. It's a conversation that I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that took place in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. But I would not call ours truth and reconciliation. Why? Because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. That's not accurate. I would use the term truth and conciliation. Conciliation is the mediation of a dispute. If reconciliation is returning us back to a a mythological harmony, conciliation allows us to start at the very broken place where we're at, which is we've never had a healthy relationship across racial lines in this nation ever. And we have to build that relationship for the very first time. I love using this quote. It was by George Erasmus, who's a native leader from what's now called Canada. And when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there a few years ago, he used this quote. He said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If we want to build community, we have to start by creating common memory. I love this quote, right? 
I think this quote gets to the heart of our nation's problem, especially regarding race, which is we don't have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers this mythological legacy of discovery and expansion, opportunity, and exceptionalism. And we have people of color who have the lived experience of stolen lands and broken treaties, of enslavement and Jim Crow laws, of boarding schools and Indian massacres, of of segregation and mass incarceration, of internment camps, families being ripped apart at our borders, and there's no common memory. And there's actually no point in U.S. history where we can look back and say that we had a healthy relationship across racial lines. That point doesn't exist. I'm not trying to shame people. I'm not trying to cancel people. I'm not trying to cause chaos and anger. I am working hard to create this common memory so that we can move towards this dialogue so that for the very first time, we can hopefully have a healthier community within our country across these racial lines. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join me for a couple hours this afternoon. The book that I wrote, On Selling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery, I have signed copies available here in the back if you'd like to purchase some of those. I'm actually running a special right now on my, uh, here and on my website, which is my book study special. You can buy 10 copies, 10 signed copies of the book for the purpose of a book study. And at some point during your study, you can schedule a virtual Q&A with me. And I'll jump on Zoom and do a Q&A with you in your study, and you can ask me directly questions you have about the book as you're working through it. But thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. And I'm happy to take a few minutes now to answer some questions if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. I know I gave you a lot to think about, so if you just need to sit and not ask questions right now, that's fine. But if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer some. I entered this journey, um, it, was a, it was a staged journey. My grandparents were boarding school survivors, and they were also Christians, and they didn't teach the culture to my father because they were told I had to give that up to become a Christian. And so a lot of my adult life, I've been on a journey to re-understand my own Navajo culture and language and heritage and people. Um, and, uh, and so I've been on a road as I've gone down that journey and I've blogged about a lot of these things over the past several dec over the past decade or so. Um, but as I've gone down that journey of trying to understand what does it mean to be Native American and be a Christian? How does my culture, my language, my people, my history impact the way that I worship and follow God? Um, I, that's what got me on this journey for the doctrine of discovery. I actually moved back to the reservation and I lived on our reservation with my family for about 11 years. Three of those years were in a very remote part of our reservation, living in a traditional community, no running water, no electricity. We lived in a single room Hogan, um, herding sheep and weaving rugs is what our neighbors did for a living. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've, as I've both lived more with my people but also had to wrestle with, right, I'm, I'm the son of my mother and my father. So the Navajo culture, you introduce yourself with your four clans and your identity is your mother's mother. So to claim I'm Navajo means I have to tell people I'm Dutch because that's who my mother's mother is. And so it's forced me to live in these two worlds where I'm not half this and half that. I am Navajo, I am Dutch, and I've had to work hard to gain integrity within both of those communities. And so that's been the impetus of the journey I'm on right now and what I'm, what I'm, why I'm working towards the goals I'm working towards. Thanks for asking that. I wanted to clarify one thing. When I said sad and disappointment, my disappointment was not at what was presented. Yeah, I understood that. It was in how Christianity and politics Yeah, I, I understood that, but thank you for clarifying it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. It was so good to have you here. I'll be in the back if you want to even just ask some questions or talk to me there too, or you can, if you want to buy a book. But I'll be around for a little bit. But it was an honor to be with you today. I'll be preaching here tomorrow. 
And maybe one of the questions you're asking yourself is, how can you still be a Christian after everything you just told us? And I'll answer some of that question tomorrow when I preach. Tomorrow I'm, I'm preaching on the passage from Acts 10, and the title of my sermon is Radical Inclusivity. Um, and so the question I've had to ask most of my life, and especially as an adult, is where do I get written into the gospel story? Right? If I'm a Gentile to the Jews and I'm a savage to Western Christianity, where do I get included in the gospel? And I'll warn you, it's not where you think it is. Um, and so I'm going to kind of shift that paradigm a bit tomorrow. But I, I, I am still a Christian. I absolutely believe I'm reconciled back to creator through the blood of Christ. And I'm excited to have a chance to preach out of some of that tomorrow and talk with the congregation here. So I got it, everybody. Thank you. If you want to, uh, I, I have several books up here. Um, this is another book on the doctrine of discovery by Sarah Augustine called The Land is Not Empty. This is one of the places I point people to is Lament. This is a book of 30 women of color sharing their poems of lament. My co-author is a professor at Fuller Seminary, and he wrote a book called Prophetic Lament. I highly recommend that book. So I'll leave some of these books up here, but it was an honor to be with all of you. And thank you.